In the last video, we saw that my biological age when using Dr. Morgan Levine's biological age calculator, PhenoAge, was se about 17 years younger than my chronological. Similarly, when using aging.ai, it was about 23 years younger. So what's contributing to these data? So first, let's take a look at supplements. And if you're familiar with the channel, the first two shouldn't be a surprise as I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism in my early 20s, early to mid 20s. So I've been taking levothyroxine about 140 micrograms per day ever since. The second is vitamin D. I supplement with vitamin D eight to nine months out of the year uh, when I'm un unable to get full body sun exposure. Uh, for this test, it was a thousand I use per day, which I've since increased and I'll have that in an upcoming video for the why. So note that I supplemented with vitamin D for 20 of the 49 days that corresponded to this test. So what does that mean? So the 49 days that corresponded to this test are from August 21st through October 10th of 2023. And why specifically those days is because August 21st was the date of test number five. So immediately after test number five, through the day before test number six, which was on October 8th, that's a 49 day period. And that lines up with the blood test data for blood test number six. All right, so the, for the third supplement, I supplemented with methyl B12, 1,000 micrograms per day for 46 of the 49 days that correspond to this test to try to reduce homocysteine as the serine plus vitamin B6 experiment didn't work. And I'll have that data in an upcoming video. I also supplemented with fish oil, EPA plus DHA, 2.1 grams per day for 18 days to pot potentially impact NAD. And if you missed that video, I'll put it in the right corner. Now note that that was early in this 49 day period from August 24th through September 10th, and it didn't work. It didn't raise NAD, so I took it out of the approach. And then last for supplements, but not least, I supplemented with nicotinic acid again, only this time a far lower dose than the 650 milligrams per day that increased my NAD very high to 67 micromolar. This time I used a 10 times lower dose of 60 milligrams per day, and I did that for 13 days and later in this period. So uh, from September 22nd, through October 4th. And I purposefully ended it a few days before the blood test because I'm not yet sure if niacin itself is messing up my epigenetic pace of aging, Dunedin pace. So I ended it a few days early before the test because I didn't want to mess up my epigenetic uh, pace of aging. Still waiting on those results for NAD. So we'll see if even a small dose of niacin was able to increase NAD. So stay tuned for that in an upcoming video. All right, so that's it for supplements, uh, which then brings us to diet. So what diet composition corresponds to this test? And that's what we'll see here. This is the average daily dietary intake over that 49 day period that corresponds to test number six. Now note that I weigh my food every day and I record that data in chronometer and then log all of that into an Excel file. So these data are as close to one can get as exact in terms of how much I was eating for each of these foods. Now I rank the foods based on the left from one to 25 and on the right from 26 to 50. So I ate 50 different foods and these foods are ranked in terms of amounts in grams with the exception of green tea, which is in ounces. And if you're familiar with the channel, the foods that are at the top of this list have been purposely consistent in 2023. That's because after 45 blood tests since 2015, this diet, including macro and micronutrients is consistently associated with relatively youthful biomarker data with a few exceptions, of course, Horvath's epigenetic age, homocysteine, but for the most part, it's a mostly youthful biomarker profile. Now, I did make a few changes for this test in terms of dietary intake relative to test number five, and that's because I tried to alter my oral microbiome by changing some of the foods that are associated with bacteria in my mouth that can reduce serratia marquescens or potentially can reduce serratia marquescens. So those foods included increasing red bell pepper, increasing yogurt, and increasing pistachio. Not big increases, very small increases, um, as I don't want to blow up the system for one variable, the oral microbiome, and mess up potentially mess up blood biomarkers. So I made some very small increases to follow the correlations with bacteria, again, that can potentially reduce serratia marquescens. And then those are the foods that I increased, but I also reduced a few foods, including mushrooms and onions, under the same premise that these foods were associated with a bacterial profile, an oral bacterial profile that may have been able to reduce serratia marquescens, which is 95% of my oral microbiome, which is just outrageous. But it didn't work, and I'll have that data in an upcoming video. Now, to meet my total fat goal of about 80 grams per day, by increasing pistachios, that means I had to reduce something else. And the, in this case, it was almonds. So I made a small cut to almonds to accommodate that small increase for pistachios. And I also added in two eggs per week 
uh, one each on workout days with the premise that uh, if I increase dietary choline intake, especially from eggs, eggs are a rich source of choline, that might be able to help reduce homocysteine to get it away from my age expected data where it currently is and to get it to more youthful values. And just as a quick aside, my folate intake is 2.5x the RDA. I'm supplementing with vitamin B12. TMG in the past, trimethylglycine, uh, didn't work up to three grams per day to reduce homocysteine. And the serine plus vitamin B6 experiment three times, three different doses, didn't work. So choline could be one area where I can increase, uh, potentially increase it to reduce homocysteine as I'm generally only around the RDA for that nutrient. All right, so the diet isn't always purposefully clean. I Try to include no more than two cheat meals per dietary period that corresponds to each test, as if I go above that, it can start to lead to an obsession with junk, and then that can trigger a binge, and that's I'm trying to completely avoid that. So two is my limit. Two, I try to make no more than two cheat meals per dietary period. And for this test, it was chocolate chips mixed with peanut butter as a homemade Reese's peanut butter cup. I'm addicted to it, what can I say? Uh, it tastes great. So. On the immediately after test number six and the day after, I mix the chocolate chips with peanut butter. So that 4.7 gram per day average isn't every day, it's exclusively on two days. And when calculating the calories from chocolate chips, it was about 1200 calories, which equates to 1.1% of my total calorie intake for this period. So 99% clean, 1% junk. All right, so this list is ranked in grams. What about foods ranked in terms of calories or top contributors for the, uh, test number six? And that's what we'll see here. So note that these data are tracked with chronometer. And if you want to measure your own diet with chronometer, that link will be in the video's description. So atop the list, as it's been for many tests now, are sardines. So I get the sardines are my number one food in terms of where I'm getting the majority of my calories from. And then in terms of the remaining foods on the top 10 list, nine of these foods are the same as they were for the first five tests in 2023 with the exception of coconut butter, which didn't make the, this list at 89 calories per day. Just, you can see the top 10 is 93 calories per day. So coconut butter just barely missed the cut. And then what entered into the top 10 for this test are collard greens. Whereas for test number five, they are at 85 calories per day. For this test, 97 grams per day. And I did that on purpose following, following correlations for vitamin K with collard greens being a great source of vitamin K with HDL. And that may actually be one reason why my HDL has now been higher than 50 for four consecutive tests. Again, I'll have that data in an upcoming video too. All right, what about macronutrient composition? How does that correspond to test number six? So first, starting with calorie intake, it was 2,115 calories per day, which you may have seen me say this a lot, but that's my, again, my lowest average daily calorie intake since I started tracking diet in April of 2015 with 2122 for test number five, being my previous low. So I've been trying to make very small cuts to calorie intake over a very long period of time with the goal of sustaining whatever fat loss that I've, or whatever fat that I've gotten rid of over the past year or so. All right, in terms of macros and protein intake, I average 95 grams per day, which is another quick aside, is about 1.5 grams per kilogram body weight with 1.6 grams uh, of protein per kilogram body weight being close to the maximum for what's been reported to maximize muscle mass as a result of strength, tra strength training. So I'm pretty close to that at 95 grams per day. I may go a little bit higher though, but that's where it was for this test. Protein intake accounted for about 18% of total calories. All right, so what about fat intake? And that's what we can see here. Average daily fat intake was about 81 grams per day, which is about 35% of total calories. And if you're interested in how total fat breaks down, including mono, poly, polyunsaturated, omega-3, omega-6, saturated, trans fats, and cholesterol. All of that data is listed there. All right, so what about carb, carb intake, carbohydrate intake? And that's what we can see here. So total carbs are about 290 grams per day, which superficially seems like a lot, but note that net carbs equals total carbs minus fiber. Average daily fiber intake for this test was 83 grams per day. And again, this is a 49-day average, not the day before the test, but for all 49 days in between test number five and test number six. So fiber was 83 grams per day. And when subtracting that from net carbs, we get uh, total carbs, we get a net carbs of 207 grams per day. Multiplying that by four calories per gram, we get that my diet for this test was about 39% net carbs. Now note that fiber also provides calories as soluble fiber within total fiber is fermented by gut bacteria into short chain fatty acids. So some percentage of the total fiber is converted into fat. 
And for this test, it was 176 calories. So it's about two calories per gram coming from the fiber uh, intake that can be added to the total fat. So that uh, just to note that total fat, uh, total fiber contributed about 8.3% of the calories of total calorie intake. So now we can calculate my net macros by adding the 8% to the 35% for total fat to get to yield a 43% fat for average fat intake every day, about 39% net carbs, and about 18% protein. And note that I didn't start off on this path with those percentages in mind. I've let the blood biomarkers guide what the diet should be. And I've settled on this diet because it seems to yield the best biomarker profile. All right, so within total carbs, I also track sugar intake and more specifically, total fructose. So fructose and sucrose. Note that sucrose is half fructose. So when dividing that by two and adding that to fructose, we get a total fructose of about 58 grams per day for this test. Now that may seem like a lot, but that's once again, I should say, close, close to my lowest fructose intake since starting diet tracking in 2015 with 57.5 grams per day, my lowest fructose intake. And I've had fructose intakes that are double that. So I've mentioned this in other videos, but 58 grams per day is actually a small win compared to my normal or my usual or what I would normally eat um, if I wasn't trying to quote unquote restrict, somewhat restrict fructose intake. All right, what about micronutrient profile? So we'll start off first with vitamins, and this may be hard to see. So uh, I'd recommend going full screen if you haven't already. So I won't highlight everything, but I just want to note that I've got full RDA coverage and that many micronutrients are purposefully higher than the RDA as I'm following correlations with blood biomarkers. And just to highlight one of them, vitamin K, you can see is more than 2,300 micrograms per day. An adequate, adequate intake or what the RDA is, is somewhere around 100 micrograms, depending on if you're a man or a woman. So I'm 23x the RDA for vitamin K and not by any random luck. It's following correlations with the blood biomarkers and that amount seems to be, again, part of the approach for correlations with an overall blood biomarker profile that's mostly youthful. All right, so next up is uh, uh, mineral intake. And if you're interested in how my mineral intake looks, I've listed it fully there. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, including daily data for food intake, macro and micronutrients, and food composition, I post that daily on Patreon. We've also got discount links and merch that you may be interested in, including discount links for at-home metabolomics, any dequantification, epigenetic and telomere testing, or microbiome composition, at-home blood testing, including ApoB, including a panel using Cyfox Health that's different from the metabolomics, so they're somewhat complementary kits, diet tracking with chronometer, green tea, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Tracking brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. Hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.